Yes, let's introduce Devon Barr. She's gonna talk about perfume for avatars. Um, Devon's career has been dedicated to the interplay of art and technology. She's currently working on a PhD in theater and performance studies at the UCLA, studying immersive technologies in live performance. She also continues to work as an artist and researcher at Stanford Stanford's electrical engineering department, where she explores multisensory storytelling in virtual spaces. Prior to this, she worked in the VR IR industry for over half a decade as both a curator and producer. Most notably, she produced the award winning Tree VR, which toured to over 90 festivals, including the Tribeca Film Festival, Cannes Film Festival, and twice to the World Economic Forum in Davos. Welcome, Devon. Hey guys, thank you for having me. Um, let me just share my screen quickly. Okay, awesome. So um, I'm here to talk to you guys today about a project called Perfume for Avatars. Um, before we do that, I want to ask you, are uh, all working in uh, scent in some way, so I'm sure you can do this, to find something nearby that you like the smell of that you're not currently smelling. So take a moment, find something. Um, I'm going to use this candle. Uh, and I'm curious, type in the chat what it is you're smelling. I'm very curious about that. And yeah, take whips of that throughout this. Um, <laughs> while you do that, I'll quickly introduce uh, yeah, I'm Devin. I'm here today mostly in my capacity as a researcher and artist in resident in Stanford's electrical engineering department. But uh, like Clara said, I'm also a PhD student in UCLA's theater and performance studies. Uh, and I'm here to talk to you about a project we have called Perfume for Avatars, where we were looking at how um, the presence of a smell can influence um, first impressions in virtual space. Uh, so this started with a team. Uh, we had a team at Stanford, which included Professor Saki Weissman, Professor Gordon Reitstein, Professor Debbie Sineski, Professor Subhash Shishmitra, myself, Devin Bauer, um, and in partnership also with the Sky Lab, which is now at UCL, um, with Professor Mariana Obdist and Dr. Emanuela Maggioni. Um, so these were the main authors on the paper and project I'm going to discuss, um, but I also wanna acknowledge that there are a lot of other people at um, these institutions that helped both to make the project happen and in the frameworks for analysis. So we started with a question, which was about how can we enhance the connection between this person and this person. Uh, we were interested in this both from a story perspective of telling stories, but also in terms of like keeping long distance relationships. Something about these online formats just isn't quite a replacement for in-person. And we were wondering if we could enhance this in any way with smell. Um, now I'll say we started asking this question in 2019 and since then obviously it has only become more relevant. Uh, and we wanted to push this just like one little step forward uh, and do it in VR. So think about that like full simulation, full immersion, completely living in this world of the computer. How can we strengthen connections between these people? And there is a lot of studies already about the role of scent in influencing virtual reality, but these are mostly environmentally based. So you maybe see a flower and smell a flower or see a cup of coffee and smell a cup of coffee. And a lot of these findings suggest that there is enhanced immersion and enhanced levels of the presence, but it just focuses on the one person who's normally going through the experience and doesn't focus on who you're sharing that experience with. Um, there's, you know, we have this olfactory identity um, that we can build mostly through perfume, right? I don't think I need to tell people here the value of perfume. <laughs> it's, um, alluring, it's attractive, but it also helps you to build an identity and ultimately it helps you to control the emotions and memories of people you come into contact with and breathe in. Um, and it just influences then what your relationships are with other people. So we wanted to move this principle into online space. Does this still work in this territory? Um, so we partnered up with Owidgets, which is, uh, if you don't know the scent machine, this is just my favorite scent machine. I've tried a lot. This came out of the Sky Lab originally. Excellent for 
keeping like the full like volume of the scent doesn't flatten the scent at all, but you still have full control about fast dispersal um, and control over the environment. Uh, and of course, with the Institute of Art and Olfaction, and we are really happy to work with Saskia in designing custom smells um, based on a lot of research specifically for this. Uh, and so we worked on making an experiment. But as I mentioned, this is a multidisciplinary project. So it was not only an experiment, but also a performance. We actually embedded our experiment inside of this immersive show. Uh, so when audiences came, they watched a performance and on the public uh, facing side, it was already multidisciplinary because they were aware that they were watching a show and part of a real experiment. Um, and on the flip side, in the research end, it was also multidisciplinary because we produced then two papers. We did a system of analysis on the results um, for like a scientific STEM paper and also a system of analysis with a more critical framework for humanity studies. So we actually have two papers based on the same live event. And this is the part where I tell you that this is now a preview of this project because <laughs> these are both in the process of publication. So I can't share with you every single detail about our procedure and methodology. And this includes what smell we used. We cannot tell you that today. Don't ask Saskia, don't ask me, but we can tell you later. But um, I can share with you some of my favorite findings um, and what people kind of said about the experience. Um, so as I said, this was a performance. So when you entered this, uh, you were like entering a world of a play and you were greeted in the afterlife waiting room. And someone in like a chipper white lab coat met you and said, um, hello, welcome to the afterlife waiting room. You've just had a near death experience and we need to analyze to understand if you're gonna move on to a nondescript next place or return to your body. Um, and you had to like fill out some paperwork, and you were in this waiting room area um, and then they take you in for this process of analysis and strap you into a VR headset. And once you go into this VR headset, you're alone in this room with just these lab technicians. Um, you see this like cartoonish liminal space around you um, and kind of hear this like echoey noise and you hear hello, hello, hello. And if you look down, you'll see this avatar. Um, so this avatar was your peer, it was someone else who was also having this um, near-death experience and you're told that you need to answer and ask questions and have a conversation with each other and that we will evaluate which one of you will return to your body and which one will move on. So this avatar was animated by an actor that was um, in a totally other room, totally different part of the building. You never saw this actor that was animating it. Um, but she would ask you questions and you would answer questions and you would reflect on your life. Um, and you did not know who this person was. It was someone that uh, was far removed from everyone who was participating. So the only impression you have of this person you met was this cartoonish avatar. Uh, and in the end, one person is selected. Of course, that would be our audience member was taken out and returned. And from this encounter and from this performance, we were able to gauge quite a few first impression metrics. Um, and for our audiences, some of them had a smell, had our perfume, and some of them did not. Um, and this is where we start to see how smell had had an influence. And a finding that I want to share with you today, one of my favorite findings, um, is that the people, the scented participants, when asked to describe this counter, encounter, described it as natural. They said it was a natural experience and a natural type of encounter. And the non-scented participants described the same encounter as artificial. And we thought that was strange. Let's ask them why. Can they like put their finger on it and explain what it is about it that made them feel this way? And the natural, this um, scented group, said, oh, it was the face, right? The thing that did it was that the lips moved in sync with what was being said, and that was enough that it felt natural. Um, so, okay, and then we asked the same thing to the non-scented group, and they said, oh, it was the face, right? I guess because I can't see the facial expressions, you can't see how they're reacting to the things you're saying. So, um, in this, both groups were, had people suggesting like, oh, it was the face. And we didn't tell them that this was about smell and we didn't bring smell to their attention. So this was them 
having a feeling of some sort and trying to uh, intellectualize it and trying to make sense of it. But as we know, smell often like passes outside of our realm of a conscious realm. So they were like having this feeling and not being able to figure out how to describe it. But I think we can scratch the surface of it a little more when we look at like other probing questions. Um, so we asked the non-scented group, can you describe the person you met? And they said things like artificial, awkward, a little stilted. And then we asked the scented group, can you describe the person you met? Um, and they said things like pleasant, warm, felt sort of sweet. Right? Not only is this like a stark contrast to how we saw it described by the non-scented group, but the scented group also used a lot of smell words to describe the person that they were meeting. Um, pleasant, warm, sweet, all things we would use to describe smell. If we go back to our central question is, okay, we can see that uh, their impression is changing a little bit of the person they're meeting, but does this help connection? Are they more connected in some way because of the presence of the smell? Um, so we asked the scented group, um, what, can you explain like the connection? Can you explain how it was that you felt related to the other person? Um, the scented group said things like, it felt like they were a kind and sensitive person. I felt very connected. I wanted to make them feel happy and come out of their shell. Um, so here we see that they see this like sliver of like a personality that they don't have full access to and want to pull more out of it, right? But there was definitely this one-on-one -on -one connection and they definitely wanted to like pull more humanity and personality out of the person they were meeting. Um, another scented person said, absolutely warm. And it was funny because you weren't alone. It was nice to have just something there to represent another entity other than just hearing a voice. It felt natural, it really did, to be in the world of the cartoon. Um, so here it's interesting because they said like something there to represent another entity other than just hearing a voice, right? And in this, they were really responding to the body and the fact that there was a body there made it feel more, more real and more connected than if there had just been a phone call. Now, if, um, you know, I could like kind of buy that and believe into that if we didn't have the responses from the non-scented group. Asked the same question about the same person, the non-scented group said things like, it was more artificial or running like a speed dating situation, ding, next person, rather than a genuine want to get to know you kind of conversation. So here there's nothing about like the sliver of personality that they want to pull out of the shell or nothing about connection. Right? It was much more just this replaceability and moving bodies through space. Um, and uh, we also had people say things like, there was nothing that jumped out at me that even clued me in that for sure I was talking to a real person versus you know, a machine with its own recording. Here, context is a lot, right? This was happening as a performance in the basement of the electrical engineering department at Stanford. So a lot of people walked into that not knowing what they were being tested on um, and thinking that they were doing some type of a Turing test, right? Like, was this person a human or not? And questioning the very like, humanness of the person on the other end. Um, but this response all came from people who were non-scented, right? Scented participants did not think they were doing a Turing test. So we just like kind of see this like questioning around the humanity of, of the body. So it makes me, leads me to believe that the body is not enough to just make it feel like a full immersion. Um, and I'll share one more response with you. And before I do that, um, I'll just tell you quickly about how the machine was working. It comes in these sprays um, and we did it in intervals. So for example, it would be something like on for five seconds, off for 10 seconds, on for five seconds, off for 10 seconds. And it dissipates quickly. So it was kind of like a, a slow build of, of sense in the room. Um, and so we asked a, a scented participant, can you describe your experience? Uh, and they said, discomfort at the beginning, like uncertainty. I guess over time, the avatar felt slightly more personable, and then I got more comfortable. And then there was moments like waves of comfort, and also jarring waves of like, oh wait, this is just an avatar. And the comfort did increase as time went on. 
Um, what I want to point to in this is the waves, right? If we think about how smell is being like dissipated for different intervals, like I would suggest that what this person is trying to like fathom or describe is this smell waves that are coming out of the machine. <laughs> and as there is like a moment of dissipation, it's like, wait a second, this is an avatar. And then you're kind of lulled into comfort again with the, the presence of the smell. So this leads us to a much larger question of why are these spaces odorless to begin with? I think you cannot answer this without going back hundreds of years and looking at like priorities in Western hierarchies of knowledge, like all the way back to Plato, of course, like he was trying to categorize the world and make sense of it and smell was difficult and complicated and he just said least important of our senses. And we have like hundreds of years of Western thinkers um, pushing similar ideas through to Western Enlightenment when Immanuel Kant said this belongs to the dust heap of the senses and Darwin says that um, smell is the most animal-like thing that we're like, getting rid of essentially um, evolving out of. Um, and then we also see this as this like weaponizing, colonizing, imperialist tool as naturalists, um, Victorian naturalists are saying things like people who, non-Western societies that still rely heavily on smell to make sense of the world or just because it's more animalistic. And um, like just seeing this kind of dangerous narrative that's progressed for all of this time until we reach this like civilized intellectualism of um, only visual and auditory signals to make sense of the world and everything else is a distraction, right? Uh, and if that was the case and if that was accurate, then this virtual space would be the ultimate like re reaching of that, this virtual space where we have only visual and auditory cues. And we find ourselves here, and in this odorless space, it's harder to make connections. And as one participant said, it's a bit too virtual, right? And I would suggest that that too is just this total like, lack of recognition for our other bodily senses, primarily smell. Any of us who study smell know that the real power of smell often becomes most visceral in its absence. If you think about mental health deteriorating from people with sudden anosmia, or the smell of a shirt from a love lost or passed on, um, or the recent COVID symptoms, like these stories, um, and maybe also virtual spaces and virtual realities and these never ending Zoom calls that we find ourselves on. Virtual spaces have been built to prioritize visual and auditory signals, but in being devoid of scent, the virtual has diminished its tendrils into memory and instinct and emotion. As such, it's changing the way that we connect with each other. As I mentioned to you, um, this project is still an open project that we're working on now. And the reason I wanted to share it with this particular community before publishing is we really wanna to talk to you about it. Uh, so I'm gonna leave you with questions instead of answers, but I would love to talk to you about consulting and collaborating more and your ideas in this space. Um, I'm curious, how would you like to use smell as a dynamic and multidimensional tool for navigating virtual space? And I don't mean like a scratch and stiff, see a coffee, smell a coffee, but thinking about everything we love about scent as this dynamic way to navigate the world. Um, what scenarios or narratives would you like to explore in this space? And I guess lastly, how would you like to use perfume for avatars? Uh, my email is there. Please take it, use it, email me. I would love to talk to you guys more. And that's our project. Um, okay, so Donna, uh, who is working uh, with Chach and a couple other folks here in LA uh, on, on a sort of study group around scent and VR, that I, I'm downplaying it, it's bigger than that. But anyway, Donna asks, did the people in the scented group acknowledge a scent? Uh, some did, some did not. Um, nobody noticed that as like the kind of like primary thing that was going on and when asked did you notice the scent some did and some did not okay i guess the quick follow-up is uh, julia is asking uh they're wondering about any prompts for participants guided in any way directly or indirectly to take note of the environment also were participants given word prompts to choose from when describing their experience natural or artificial can i can you repeat the first part of the question 
Yeah, sure. Sorry. I'm also garbling my words. I'm wondering about any prompts. Were participants guided in any way, directly or indirectly, to take note of the environment? Um, during the experience, uh, I'm trying to think what, how much I can, can share. During the experience, there was not like a verbal prompt of making sense of the environment. Um, and in uh, outtake, um, there were certain, uh, certain questions are, that are like kind of formed around a prompt and certain questions were not. Um, for example, everything to do with like the facial expressions and everything to do with like um, waves of scent and all of that, none of that was prompted. Everything to do with like warm, sweet smells. Um, and I would say the evaluation process was much more about them having free reign to discuss than us telling them what to think. Cool, thank you. Um, James is wondering if you had any uh, neuroscientists involved. Uh, we had uh, not specifically neuroscientists, but um, psychologists that specialize in smell, which is primarily from the Skylab. Um, you guys probably know Dr. Emanuela Maggioni and then, uh, Professor Marina Oprest is more on the human computer interaction side. Uh, and then Jacqueline, Jackie Mori, who's presenting tomorrow on, um, on her work with VR and scent, pioneering work with VR and scent, uh, says that she had similar results when using scent in VR. No one remembered the smells, but the experience was more memorable. No question, just a comment for, or for corroboration. Yeah, I think I can comment, corroborate back, which is you really can't tell people about the smell. I think once you tell people about the smell, it's over, right? Um, there's, it, it's very, I, I, I can talk a lot about that, but once people know it changes everything and that's all they can focus on, um, which I think is really interesting about it. Um, okay, so Chach, Chacha says, uh, did you say all of the participants were engineers? Uh, and she follows that engineers might not have much of a scent language. Uh, not all of them were engineers, but a lot of them were engineers. Um, and I would say most of them did not have a heavy scent language. This was not a, a smell focused like test group that we worked with. Um, and I actually was surprised how many people failed a basic smell test when we gave this. Um, we asked people to smell a number of things and only one of them was scented and a lot of people failed that. So obviously all of those people were taken out of the experience. Interesting. Uh, sorry, we're peppering you with questions here. Devin, are you, you okay for one more? Yeah, feel free. Okay, cool. Uh, Mika says, I understand that scent memory is more accurate than any other type of memory. Any thoughts on how these findings can help in the context of education to help students better learn? Uh, yes, so now that we're on Zoom, um, I'm at UCLA and I have um, classes I'm TAing and classes I'm taking and whenever I work with a group of students, uh, I always tell them to, particularly in the Zoom environment, like have different candles associated with different classes or have different smells that they're releasing um, when they come into my classroom and like that has been kind of like my gateway into thinking about using this as more of a teaching tool before that my like classroom environments were all in person. And now that I think we're going to see this movement forward of classrooms online, I know we're gonna be online for a while. Um, I'm just kind of playing around with forcing them to do that. <laughs> but I, I do think that this is a, a tool that I wanna further utilize. And I, I hope you guys enjoyed smelling something and maybe liked the talk a little bit more because of it. And if you didn't, if you didn't like the talk, maybe you didn't like what you were smelling. <laughs> Clever, clever <laughs> strategy. <laughs> I'm going to use that. Well, that's not my fault. <laughs> um, Cleo uh, Maniatti, calling in from Argentina. Hi, Cleo. Says, very interesting work. Have you investigated on the importance of the absence of touch during the experience, experiment? You are looking into the absence of smell, but shouldn't your control experiment be one where all the senses are kept intact and only smell is missing? Uh, we can see in the book that's on my desk, a next, next phase, I uh, have The Deepest Touch by Constance Klassen, sensory study, um, who I, I really like the work she's done in smell. Um, yeah, I do think touch is, is a next step. Uh, I think touch is explored a little bit more and it's a little bit easier to quantify and to measure. Um, and it's a bit easier to control, right? Like we have a lot more control on touch at this moment. Um, we don't know a lot about smell, um, as I'm sure everyone here knows. 
in terms of uh, recreation and how it works in the human brain. But I think a big part of that is that it hasn't been prioritized. Um, so as a first push in this area, I think smell is like a very attainable way to start to um, merge online spaces with virtual spaces. You have just a lot more happening in terms of what's firing in your brain um, and a lot more happening in terms of the scope of what you can create just through the presence of a smell in like leading into these virtual spaces. Touch is more complicated, you know, the nuances of like just poking here all day is never going to do as much as releasing a smell that smells like your grandmother's house in some way, right? So um, I think in terms of leading those two spaces together, I'm interested in, in smell as a first port, but I think touch and things like that come second. But there is some level of haptics in the control, right? Um, the control naturally has that built in. Um, okay, last question. Thank you for taking them all. Eddie uh, Baliki asks, um, if you came across any evidence that suggested that the presence or absence of smell uh, heightened or weakened participants' ability to think critically or their susceptibility to let down their guard from an objective truth standpoint. Uh, and Eddie is thinking here of digital's transition, sorry, digital's traditional position as a space of deception. Um, I have a hard time with, uh, well, I'd have to talk more to you about how do we measure objective truth. Um, but aside from that, uh, it's definitely a tool for manipulation, no doubt. Um, and I think it's really already being used in non-virtual spaces. I, we are all aware of the ways in which smell is being used to manipulate how we navigate the physical world through like smells being churned out at Disneyland and like lemon being added to products to make it smell clean. Uh, and I think we need to think very critically uh, as scholars and as artists about how to understand what that space means and like bring that to light for the public and think about how to use that, like set guidelines for how to use that or best practices, um, because it can be used as a manipulation tool for good or for worse. Uh, cool. And then, and so I, I, you're not able to share information about the sense um, and just to remind everybody of that. But would you be able to share where you where people can find out about this project when it's published, when it's ready to, to be public? Yeah, um, I'll put my email in here again. Uh, feel free if you are interested to um, know more about the project. If you have direct questions, you can email me. Um, or if you just want to be on a list for when this is released, um, I'm happy to take your, your email and send you the updates as it comes. I don't have a newsletter or anything, so you're not signing up to a wild MailChimp. I would just send you the article. <laughs> I love a wild meal chimp. <laughs> <laughs> all right, Devin, well, thank you so much for your time. Thank um, you guys so much for having me, and thank you to all the other speakers. This has been yeah. awesome.